On Sunday, July 12th, I encouraged and challenged this congregation to memorize, to read, to recite three passages of scripture. But more importantly, I challenge you to live according to the truth that is revealed to us in those three passages of scripture. Isaiah 41.10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. And then Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And then Psalm 126, 3. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Now, those are great passages of Scripture. Now, two Sundays ago, uh, we addressed in the, the morning message Isaiah 41, 10. Uh, this last Sunday, we dealt with Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. And today, we will take up Psalm number 126. This psalm is perfectly appropriate for a time of change, for a time of crisis, uh, whether the crisis is worldwide, as we see with a pandemic, whether it's national, with, with social unrest, whether it's local, whether it's, whether it's a time of change in a church, or a challenges for a family, or an individual challenge. The message of Psalm number 126 is powerful and timely. It's a lesson that we need to learn again and again. But even more importantly, it's a lesson that we need to put into action again and again. Because every one of us goes through challenging times and every one of us goes through changing times. Many times we feel like the challenge will never end. That that, that burden will never ever be lifted. And sometimes we, 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 we want the pace of change to come to a complete stop or, or at least slow down. But the pace of change seems to increase, get to get faster and faster. Well, Psalm 126 is exactly what you need in all of those times. It's a message of hope. It tells you that times of trouble and challenge do not last. And that while they do last, God is still with you and in control. God has an amazing way of, of turning tears into joy. And the method, now this is important, the method prescribed here, this is a prescription in Psalm 126, is to turn our memories into prayer. Turn our memories into prayer. So the psalm has two stanzas. There's the first three verses, which you see here, and then later we'll get to the second three verses. It's only six verses long. Now the first stanza encourages you to, to marvel at God's provision, to celebrate God's blessings, how he's helped you in the past. And then as you move toward the second stanza, we are to turn those memories into prayer. And therefore, the second portion of the, the message is that we must pray and trust God to do again, to provide again, to minister and bless again. So the first point is, number one, to marvel at and celebrate how God has helped you in the past. First of all, we are to marvel at how God has helped us in days gone by. So uh, let's have the reading of the first three verses. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. So this first stanza calls us to, to marvel at and to celebrate how God has helped us in the past. But we're not simply just to, to think about it or reflect upon it or remember it. We are to marvel. We are to celebrate, and to celebrate in a way that, that is visible to all. We're going to see three observations in this first point. The first one is that God is so amazing that often we think, I must be dreaming. 
When God delivers you big time, you can feel like you're in a dream. Look at verse 1. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. The year was 606 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar's army came through and they carried away uh, the residents of of Judah to Babylon. It it began the Babylonian captivity. And they were there for 70 years. And during that time, uh, actually by the end of that period of time, most of the residents of what we would call uh, the, 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 the kingdom of Judah, the Jews, had been born in Babylon. They had established homes. They had built houses in the new land. It's all they knew. It was the new way of life. And then in the year 536 BC, everything changed and it changed in an instant. There was a new king, King Cyrus. And he made a proclamation. That proclamation that the Jews were to be returned home. For those of you in our Bible reading program, you read that this, this past week uh, in, in the book of Ezra. So the king returns them home. They've been in captivity 70 years. This is the way we will live life forever. And then in a moment, just like that, everything changes. They were, they were in shock. They couldn't believe it. Too good to be true. It says right there. It's like they were dreaming. Can you believe it? It's impossible. Couldn't have happened, and yet it did. And now they find themselves back in Jerusalem, back in the holy city, the place where God's people dwell, and it all felt like a dream. They were called here in this psalm to remember that experience. It was like a dream, but it was a reality. And we need to do that as well. We need to remember many of the ways in which God has provided for the needs of this congregation, Nova PBC. We've mentioned the, uh, around 500 people that have become active in our congregation and then most of those have, have moved on. That is, that is amazing. God's blessing has been amazing. Now I've gone back through the list and looked at all those names. It's like it is a dream world. All these different people coming into our experience and going out with the love of God within them. One of our members was moved to tears just recently as in their daily prayer time they began to recount the miraculous surgeries, the phenomenal events, the amazing physical healings that had been experienced. They were moved to tears because they were praising God what seemed like absolute impossibilities. We've had families recover from financial ruin. We didn't have a pianist at one point. We prayed and God miraculously provided us a pianist. A great answer to prayer. We've had reconciled reconciled, uh, relationships. Relationships that were in tatters, now brought together. Marriages that moved from life support to to thriving unions. We've had uh, a a significant number of, of professions of faith. It's amazing. Growth in grace. Discipleship. It's one of... Uh, share a, a, a couple of words just uh, recently received. One person said, I know that I have grown more spiritually at this church than any other that I have ever been a part of. And I've been in some good churches and, and with good pastors. That's a praise of the Lord. That's, that's an amazing blessing. That's something to be celebrated and marveled at. Another person talking about uh, the fellowship and the ministry of the entire body said after visiting other churches. The friendliness of this church was something that I had not experienced in almost 10 years of living in the Maryland, Virginia, D.C. area. Those are things to be celebrated with, with great joy. We had debt. Debt is gone. Purchased a, a rental house that's going to become a pastorium possibly. God has worked phenomenally. And many times it seemed like we were dreaming. How could this happen? How could this great blessing be? And it's because God amazes us. We need to marvel at that, but not just marvel at it. We need to celebrate it, and we see that as we move to verse 2. We're not only to marvel at what God has done, but we are to celebrate. Verse 2 says, uh, the first portion of it, 
Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Does that sound like they're celebrating? I think they're celebrating with a glad heart, with great joy. Now they had had tremendous sorrow. They had been carried away. Many of them had known the joy of living in Jerusalem and in Judah. And that was gone. They were in a strange land. And the, the lament and the sorrow was real. Parents told newborn children about how it was and how it is now. Psalm 137 is a dramatic example of how, 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 how horrible their life was. It says, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion, we remembered Jerusalem. There on the poplars we hung our harps and our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded us to sing songs of joy. They said, sing us the songs of Zion. And we said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord? Well, in a foreign land. The tormentor said, sing, be happy, be happy. But they sat by the river in Babylon and they wept. But now an amazing work of God has happened and they've been miraculously returned. Not just said, you can go, but they went with their coffers full. They went with financial resources to rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls. And their mouths were now filled with laughter and songs of joy. They were celebrating. In fact, joy and happiness and singing and celebration, it, it resonates through all of Psalm 126. To so brothers and sisters, whether it be a, a, a change of time such as our church is having, or whether it's in your own life or the challenge that, that, that you feel is overwhelming, Sometimes when you have tears and sorrow, you wonder if you'll ever laugh again. And Psalm 126 says, you will. In God's time, your, your sorrow will be lifted and, and God will fill your, your mouth with laughter and, and songs of joy. I must be dreaming. It leads us to celebration. Just one of the many, many, many examples, and there are so many spiritual examples, I'm going to go to a a facility example. We tried to buy the property right next door to us, the adjoining property, just here to our south. We tried for years. We would go over and visit with the owner, and he'd say, I want you to have this house. We drew up the contract, and he'd say, okay, and then he'd say, well, I'll think about it. And then a year later, he'd say, well, I'm ready to do it. We'd go back over. Now the price is 50000 more. We'd come to an agreement. He'd say, well, I'm ready to do it. We'll think about it. Again and again. And again, and then he passes away, and then an unscrupulous lawyer is involved who ends up being disbarred and put into prison because he embezzled a lot of money from that estate. And that property goes elsewhere. Failure, 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 failure. We'll never buy an adjoining piece of property. And then miraculously, unexpectedly, God provides the property immediately to our north, or excuse me, east, uh, becomes available. It's purchased, it's done, it's put to bed. Deal done. And celebration. We celebrated, we, we marveled. You are to marvel and to celebrate and you're to do that publicly. The celebration should be for all to see, for the nations to see and understand and therefore to bring honor and glory to God and God alone. When God does a great work in your life, the work of salvation, the work of provision, the work of, of remedying a relationship flaw. Whenever God works in your heart to get rid of a, a, an element of bitterness, whenever God brings about an unexpected great gift, we are to celebrate it and bring glory to God and have the great joy and celebration in our own hearts. You see that in the second half of verse 2 and all of verse 3. It says, Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things things for them. The Lord has done eight things for us and we are glad. This was an amazing thing. Babylon had captured nation after nation after nation. They had brought them into their, into their region of the world. They had resettled other lands. They just didn't return people to their lands. They didn't do that. And all of a sudden King Cyrus now, different reign, returns them to their land. 
And they say the Lord has done great things for us. And that's exactly right. Nobody else could have done that except the Lord. And that's why the surrounding nation said, wow, this is amazing. You see, God's salvation is seen by the nations, those who surround you. And it should be always. It's amazing to me. The Old Testament rings with the cry, so that they may know that I am your God. That's about you. It's about you and me. Everything God does is so that those around us will know that the Lord is our God. Moses said to Pharaoh, Let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. In Jeremiah it says, Inasmuch as there is no one like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among the wise men of the nations and in their kingdoms, there is none like you. These verses remind us that we have a responsibility to share the good things God does in our life with others. We are to marvel, we are to celebrate, and we are to do it publicly. Jesus said in the great Sermon on the Mount, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel. But what? But on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Why? Why should our light so shine before men? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do your friends and neighbors know what God has done for you? Do they know where God is on your priority list? Do you share your testimonies of God's goodness and God's grace and and God's provision and the joy you have in the Lord? Christians should be the most joyful people in the world because why? Because God has done great things for us and we are glad. That's simple, straightforward passage. Now, verses 1 and 2 are in the past. It's looking back to when God delivered the nation of Judah out of that captivity and return them to their homeland. Verses 4, 5, and 6 we will see are in the future. But verse 3 is in the present. You see, right now, we are to have joy and celebration in the presence based upon remembrance of God's past blessings. This church right now needs to look back and celebrate now and praise the Lord now. Anytime God does a work of provision or deliverance in our life, we are to celebrate now. So we're to marvel. We're to celebrate God's provision. Now he's helped us in the past. We need to remember. We must remember. We must celebrate. But not just uh, because it's right to honor God. It is. And not just because it's wonderful to celebrate. And it is. Because it puts us in the right biblical frame of mind to pray to God once again to bless us in amazing ways so we turn our past memories into prayer turn our past memories into prayer and that leads right into the second point therefore second point is we pray trusting God to do it again to provide again in amazing ways look at verse 4 5 and 6 Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. So he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So the captives uh, captives are back in Jerusalem, but there's much work to be done. They get back there. they, They need to rebuild the temple. They need to rebuild the walls. They're faced with discouragement from within their own camp and outside their camp as well. God had worked to deliver them in the past. And now they need him to do it again. If there's a phrase to include in all of your prayers is, Lord, I need you. Lord, we need you now. Just like in the past. We need you now. We need you now in our world. We need you now in our nation. We need you now in in our community. We need you now in our church, in my life, in my family. 
Lord, I, we, we, uh, we come trusting you to bless us once again. Every day is filled with new challenges. And sometimes they are phenomenally unique. We say, I never thought I'd be dealing with this. One of my favorite passages from Lamentations teaches us that God tailor makes his grace and his mercy anew every day, specifically for the challenges we will face that day. Tailor made, specifically fitted for that day. God, you've done great things in the past, and we need you to do it again. So we need to pray for God to restore and to bless again. And that's what we see in verse 4. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Now the Hebrew here is a little bit challenging. I'm going to put this in, in different words. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. The streams of the south. What is that? Well, let's, first of all, let's deal with bring back or restore. You see that, uh, bring back our captivity, O Lord. That's the same exact Hebrew word it was used in verse number one. So it ties you back there. God, we need to be restored once again. So we have two images here to speak about how God works in our life. God works suddenly and unexpectedly, just like the Jews having word, you're going back home. But as well... He, he, he works through us. We'll get to that in a moment. So he works suddenly and expectedly, and that's where we come to understand this as the streams in the south. The south was Negev. It's, it's wilderness. I blew up, grew up in farming country, Illinois. Black soil, rich, deep, fertile, you know, 300 bushel corn, amazing, phenomenal. Sometimes those Illinois farmers would take a tour of the Holy Land and they would go into that Judean wilderness and they would come back and say, that's a testament that only God could bring something good out of that. Because if you've ever been there, parched, dry, desolate. The soil is, is not fertile. It, 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 it's, it's dry. And that's what the word Negev means. It means dry or parched land. But in the winter and the spring, in the Holy Lands, the rains come, and for that short period of time, things flourish. The seeds find roots, and they sprout up, and the, and the, the flocks are able to be, to, be, to be fed. God's sudden outpouring of blessing, just like you do in the parched wilderness, O Lord. And there's many times in our times of change and times of challenge that, that we feel like a desert ourselves spiritually dry and parched. Well, a time like that, you need to pray for God to restore you, to pour out the, the, the rains of, of divine blessings, to restore you uh, in, as he has in the past, but to provide you new blessings for the situation at hand, just like the streams in the desert. We need to pray that not only for ourselves, but for the church. This is a prayer for revival. The return from captivity of Israel was, was something only God could do, and God did it. Same way, revival in a church is only something that God can do. Great preacher said, God does more in five minutes than man did in the previous ten years. So I've been pastor here a little over 20 years, so it means God did more in ten minutes. <laughs> That's just... It's not, not just a humbling statement, it's an accurate statement. We need to pray for God to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out his blessings upon the church. But then the second thing we see in this, this second half of the, uh, uh, this psalm is that we need to know that God will turn our sorrow to joy. There is absolute confident hope. We have this in verse number 5. It says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now, the first image here is the streams of the Negev, the streams of the Southland, the Judean wilderness. The second is that of sowing in tears. The first picture we saw in verse 4 points to the work of God and God alone. It's, it's sudden, undeserved, phenomenal blessings. And the second one points to God working through your efforts and through our efforts, together. So I want to go back to one of my favorite phrase, 
according to God's word, always do what is right. Trust God with the results. Don't worry about results. Do what is right. Trust God with the results. So here we have in these two verses, 4 and 5, is the difference between God's miracles and God's provision and providence. And both of them are ways of God's working. Just different. We see this in our lives. When someone is ill, what do we as a congregation do? We pray. Pray for what? For divine healing. Have we seen that? Amen. What do I ask whenever they call and ask for healing because I have this serious illness? What do the doctor say? I expect them to seek medical care and to take appropriate uh, precaution and to take appropriate medication and receive appropriate treatment based upon the doctor's involvement and, and uh, prescribed treatments. So both. There's an old saying that says, pray as if it all depended upon God, but work as if it all depended upon you. Now I would just tell you there's some truth in that. There's also some theological error in that, but that's a whole other sermon. So there's some truth, some error in that. I think a better way of saying that is, Work and pray as if it all depends upon God working through you at this moment. You being used as a vehicle of grace. So always do what is right and trust God with the results. According to this passage of scripture, in a spirit of of marvel and celebration that is publicly known, always in that context do what is right and trust God with the results. God often works in deliberate ways as we yield our lives to him. Now the picture here is of sowing and reaping. Why do you sow in tears and reap with joy? We have to understand the land. And I'll use an example from the Sahara Desert that is very similar in all ways to this Judean wilderness. The Sahara Desert in West Africa, very similar climate, And the rainfall comes through May to August. That's when the rain comes, that's when the crop grows. And the other eight months are parched. Nothing grows. So you plant uh, in those few months, and you reap the harvest, and you put up the harvest, and you eat well, and, and you celebrate, and you have great joy. But by the time February comes around, people are starting to get hungry. And then by March and April, food is actually being rationed. And the word is that that you can hear the babies crying from hunger. Then picture this, a young young boy runs up and says, Daddy, 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 we we can eat again because I've I've found grain up in the the upper portion of the hut where we keep the goats. There's grain, we found grain, we can eat. And Dad says, oh no, that's seed for our next crop. Us being able to eat and exist depends upon us sowing that seed. But Daddy, I'm hungry. And many people have said, as the rains begin to fall, and the dad goes out with children crying, Daddy, I need to eat. He sows the grain with tears. And four months later, he reaps with great joy. Now that's that's an important point. We need to realize that sowing and reaping involve not just techniques and principles, it involves emotions and faith as well. Sometimes the soil seems so hard. Sometimes it seems that, that we've sowed and sowed and nothing will ever grow. Sometimes things make no sense. God asks us to keep sowing, trust Him. Now as a church, There are many times that we have stepped out on faith. When we bought that pastorium, uh, there were those who who very lovingly and respectfully came up later and said, I voted for that because everybody did. Man, I don't know if this is going to work out or not. This this is a big deal. This is a lot of money. Well, we're probably going to have another uh, time of stepping out on faith. We'll consider uh, investing money to upgrade and uh, and update the pastorium. It's 70 years old. There's been no major renovation or updating in 70 years. Kind of the 
I guess that's the same as the Babylonian captivity, 70 years. <coughs> won't, won't go too far down that trip. The, the place has a 1950s pink kitchen. It's original. It was what was installed in the 50s. Now, one thing's kind of interesting. We're going to skip right over the pastel aqua phase and the avocado green kitchen phase and the harvest gold and the almond and then that black refrigerator. Everybody had to get a black refrigerator. Then we've all moved to stainless steel because now that's the new cool. Well, the bathrooms are the same situation. So it's going to be a step of faith to sow in the midst of a time of change, anticipating God's blessings of harvest. We need to trust God and be faithful in planting the seed in the present and trust God to faithfully bring forth the harvest in the future just as he has time after time after time after time. So are you going through a time of challenge? Are you going through a time when change is outdone by the change of today? And now I've begun to expect the change is going to even get faster tomorrow. Well, are you faithfully sowing obediently according to the word of God? If you are, please know, God turns our tears of sorrow in sowing to shouts of joy and laughter in reaping. Psalm 30 says, weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. There's never been a sunset thus far in the created world that wasn't followed by a sunrise. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. And then we see that trusting God with the results, we should always trust God with the results and continue to be obedient. Look at verse 6. He who continually goes forth weeping bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now that, that expands on the image in verse number 5 of sowing uh, faithfully uh, and trusting God for the results, eventually returning with harvest in our hands. And it reminds us, brothers and sisters, here and gathered around the country and the world, it reminds us in times of change, in times of challenge, there is always work to be done now. Obedient work, leadership of God's spirit, the truth of God's word. There is work to be done now, and that work will bear much fruit in our lives and bring honor and glory to God, our Father who art in heaven. First Peter says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him, in doing good as to the faithful creator. Book of Galatians gives a wonderful word of encouragement. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. When we as a nation, when we as a church, when we as families and individuals are walking through a time of challenge, when we're going through times of significant change, we are to marvel and we are to celebrate at what God has done in the past. And we are to do that publicly so the nations and the peoples and the neighbors shall know. But not only shall they know, we shall be glad and we are to turn that joyful memory into prayer. And then we are to pray and trust God to do it again and again and again. Pray for God to restore and to bless once again, to know that God will turn that sorrow into joy and trust God with the results and continue to be obedient. God has done great things. Let us be glad and turn that memory into a prayer for the future.